Welcome to section 47 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video, we'll be discussing Chlamydia trachomatis, Chlamydophila pneumoniae, and Chlamydophila sataki. You can see all three of these organisms right here. This scene takes place near an elementary school out on the playground. You can see that one of the teachers is out on the playground greeting some children who are coming to school. If you look closely at the kid in the blue shirt, you can see that he's holding a container of clams. It's show and tell day, so he's pretty excited to show off his clams to his classmates. Clams sounds like chlamydia. So this kid coming to school for show and tell with a cage full of clams should help you remember that this image is all about chlamydia. Okay, before we go any further, let's briefly discuss the organization of this image. Most of the image will be about chlamydia trachomatis, so we'll show these details outside of the fenced-in area, whereas the information about chlamydophila pneumoniae and chlamydophila sataki will be shown inside of the fenced area right here. All right, with this in mind, let's continue discussing the image. Now look at the teacher's shirt. That's right, it has the letter S on it, which, just like in our other videos, is here to help you remember that most serotypes of chlamydia trachomatis are sexually transmitted. We'll talk about the exceptions in a minute. All right, now I'd like to point out that the clams are in a cage and that we've been using cages to represent obligate intracellular organisms. So chlamydia is an obligate intracellular organism. Interestingly, chlamydia cannot make ATP, so it relies on the energy produced from host cells and must be within host cells to benefit from this energy dependency. Okay, Chlamydia trachomatis has a unique lifestyle, which is high yield for step one. So let's discuss this with a diagram first, and then I'll help you memorize these details with the image mnemonic. This is an image depicting the life cycle of Chlamydia trachomatis. As you can see, the organism has two forms, elementary bodies and reticulate bodies. Elementary bodies are the infectious form that enter the cell via endocytosis. You can see that right here. Once inside the cell, the elementary bodies form reticulate bodies which you can see right here. Here, they replicate through binary fission and are then reorganized into elementary bodies. Eventually, the cell is destroyed, elementary bodies are released, and the cycle is repeated. Okay, now let's return to the image to help you memorize these facts. I had mentioned that the teacher is greeting the kids, but if you look at her outstretched arms, you can actually see that she's about to hug these elementary school kids. She gives them a hug and they go inside of the elementary school, which you can see is appropriately labeled right behind the teacher right here. Anyway, the hug represents endocytosis and the elementary school kids represent elementary bodies. So putting these two ideas together should help you remember that elementary bodies enter the cell via endocytosis. Next, notice that we've shown several rakes inside of the school windows. Rake sounds like reticulate, so we've shown this here to help you remember reticulate bodies. The school can be thought of as a symbol for inside of the cell, and the fact that there are two rakes seen inside of the school should help you remember that reticulate bodies replicate inside of the cell by binary fission. Finally, notice that there are several elementary school kids shown leaving the school. Again, the elementary school children represent elementary bodies, and the school represents the cell. So this is here to help you remember that the reticulate bodies are reorganized into elementary bodies released from the cell and then infect adjacent cells. All right, let's move on. Now notice that we've shown a girl sitting on a bench. She was looking at her hair with a mirror when she accidentally dropped it on the ground and it shattered into a bunch of little pieces. Mirror sounds like meramic acid, which is a normal component of peptidoglycan within the bacterial cell wall. So the fact that the mirror is breaking should help you remember that the cell wall of chlamydia lacks meramic acid. This is one of the reasons why chlamydia doesn't gram stain well, and is also the reason why it's resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics, which normally target the cell wall. Now we've added two kids on the playground that are playing some card games together. Games sounds like gimsa, so this is here to help you remember that chlamydia can be identified using the gimsa stain. This is a gimsa stain of chlamydia. The arrows are pointing to cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. To go along with the playground setting, notice that we've added a swing set to the image. The swings are suspended in the air by chains, and because it's a warm sunny day, there happen to be a bunch of gnat bugs in the air surrounding the swing set. The chains represent polymerase chain reaction, and the gnat bugs represent nucleic acid amplification test, or gnat. So this part of the image should help you remember that chlamydia is diagnosed with NAT, which consists of amplifying bacterial DNA or RNA sequences using PCR. Okay, now that we've discussed many of the general characteristics, let's move on to discuss the specific serotypes of chlamydia trachomatis that you need to be familiar with. The serotypes are broken up into three groups based upon their clinical presentations. So we'll show three clustered groups towards the front of our image. One group on the left right here, one in the middle right here, and one on the right over here. Serotypes A, B, and C will be shown on the left next to this apple tree. The letter A in apple should help you remember serotypes A, B, and C. Now you can see that we've added a guy with a dog. The letter D in dog should help you remember serotypes D through K. Finally, notice that we've added a lamp off to the right side of the image. The letter L in the word lamp 
should help you remember that this part of the image is all about serotypes L1, L2, and L3. Okay, let's go back and talk about serotypes A, B, and C. As you can see, now we've added a guy holding hands with this lady next to the apple tree. The fact that they are holding hands should help you remember that serotypes A, B, and C exhibit hand-to-hand -hand transmission. This is a bit unique because, as we discussed earlier, the other serotypes exhibit sexual transmission. However, serotypes A, B, and C all exhibit hand-to-hand -hand transmission. You probably noticed that the African-American guy is blind, which is why he's holding the lady's hand in the first place. You can tell that he's blind because of his sunglasses and walking stick. So, blind African-American guy for serotypes A, B, and C are common in Africa and can cause trachoma, which is the leading cause of blindness in the world. Trachoma is characterized by roughening of the eyelid surface, which then damages the cornea and eventually leads to blindness. Alright, now let's move on to serotypes D through K. The blind man was initially walking into the street a bit too far before the girl came over and grabbed his hand, which is what caused this accident. As you can see, the pregnant woman driving in the red car tried to avoid crashing into the blind guy when she swerved and accidentally crashed into the dirt bike. Now the pregnant woman has partially fallen out of the car and her pelvis is caught on fire. Her pelvis on fire should help you remember pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. The fact that this is occurring next to the dog should help you remember that serotypes D through K cause urethritis and PID. Also notice that she's partially outside of the car just like an ectopic pregnancy occurs outside of the uterus. So this scene should help you remember that serotypes D through K cause pelvic inflammatory disease which increases the risk of ectopic pregnancy. Now you can see that we've added two babies inside of the car as well as some car fragments on the ground. Let's zoom up on this so you can see it better. First, notice that the babies have their mouths open like they're screaming or coughing. It's probably a combination of both, considering that smoke is bound to be in the car with that fire on the mom's pelvis. And likewise, they were just in an accident, which is pretty traumatic. Anyway, the babies are here to help you remember that serotypes D through K cause neonatal pneumonia. As the baby is passing through the birth canal of an infected mother, it can acquire the disease and develop pneumonia. We've also shown the little fragments of the red car on the road that occurred as a result of the accident. They're red and circular with little spots inside of them, and kind of resemble eosinophils. So, putting these two ideas together should help you remember that serotypes D through K cause a neonatal pneumonia with eosinophilia. If you look closely at the baby's eyes, you can also see that they're red. They're in a red car and the flames are surely reflecting off of their eyes, giving them the red appearance. The red eyes should help you think of conjunctivitis and the fact that there are two babies should help you remember that serotypes D through K cause neonatal conjunctivitis one to two weeks after birth. The timing here is actually pretty important because gonorrhea can present very similarly, but typically occurs earlier. So remember that chlamydia causes neonatal conjunctivitis that occurs one to two weeks after birth. All right, now notice that we've shown another victim of this car accident, this old granny. She was riding on her dirt bike when she got hit by the red car. Now you can see that she has wounds on the side of her legs, so she'll probably be limping around for a while until her legs heal. Anyway, limping granny sounds like lymphogranuloma, and the fact that she's next to the lamp should help you remember that serotypes L1, L2, and L3 cause lymphogranuloma venarium. This is a sexually transmitted infection characterized by a painless genital ulcer and inguinal lymphadenopathy, or inguinal buboes. You may have noticed that she was wearing a cup on her crotch. The cup protected her crotch from getting injured in the accident, just like the genital ulcers of lymphogranuloma venarium are painless. So grandma wearing a crotch for serotypes L1, L2, and L3 cause painless genital ulcers. The red swollen lesions on the side of her legs extending up near her inguinal region should help you remember that serotypes L1, L2, and L3 cause painful inguinal buboes. Finally, she got in a crash with her dirt bike which is our symbol for doxycycline. So the dirt bike should help you remember that serotypes L1, L2, and L3 are treated with doxycycline. All right, let's move on and discuss a few other features regarding chlamydia trachomatis. Notice that we've added a girl on the bench that's writing. Let's zoom up so you can see her better. Writing sounds like writer. So just like in our other videos, we've shown this girl writing to help you remember that writer syndrome is a complication that can occur following a chlamydia trachomatis infection. As we discussed in other videos, this presents with the classic triad of conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. Okay, now you can see that we've added several gondola toys on the playground. These are a reference to our Neisseria gonorrhea image and are here to help you remember that patients who have a chlamydia infection also often have a gonorrhea co-infection. Okay, everything we've covered so far is regarding chlamydia trachomatis, but now let's briefly discuss Chlamydophila pneumoniae and Chlamydophila sataki. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, these two organisms will be represented inside of the fence right here, where we've added two more characters to the scene. If we zoom up, you can see that one person is using a new lawnmower to cut the grass. This is a special mower because it was designed by a brand that likes to use clams for a logo, as you can see by all the clams plastered on the machine. 
New mower sounds like pneumonia, and the fact that it has clams as a logo on it should help you remember that this part of the image is about Chlamydophila pneumoniae. The other guy inside of the fenced area is carrying a bag of pistachios, which sounds kind of like sitake. So he's here to help you remember Chlamydophila sitake. As you can see, there was a bunch of smoke coming out of the mower, as mowers tend to do. And this is here to help you remember that both Chlamydophila sitake and Chlamydophila pneumoniae are transmitted through aerosolized droplets. As the smoke rises into the air, you can see that both of these guys begin to cough. This is to help you remember that both organisms cause pneumonia. Finally, notice that we've shown a blue bird on this guy's shoulder. The bird is here to help you remember that birds are reservoirs for Chlamydophila sitake. Okay, let's zoom back out and finish up by discussing treatment. Notice that we've added a gardener guy who's holding a trident. The trident is here to help you remember that chlamydia is treated with ceftriaxone. Finally, we've shown a kid going down a zip line in the playground. Zippers and zip lines are symbols for azithromycin. So this should help you remember that chlamydia is also treated with azithromycin. We discussed this idea in the Neisseria gonorrhea video, but recall that azithromycin is used to cover chlamydia and ceftriaxone is used to cover a possible gonorrhea co-infection. So both antibiotics should be used. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 12-day-old infant is brought to the emergency department by his mother due to red eyes. She states that she did not have prenatal care due to financial concerns, but that the boy was delivered at home without complications. Physical examination reveals erythema and mucopurulent discharge surrounding both eyes. The infectious serotype responsible for this patient's condition may also cause A. Groin pain and a painless genital ulcer, B. Trachoma, C. Septic arthritis, or D. Pelvic inflammatory disease. Alright, let's go through the key points. First, the boy is 12 days old. This is important because it helps distinguish chlamydia from gonorrhea. Second, he was born to a mother who did not have prenatal care, which means she is much more likely to have had an untreated STI. And third, physical examination revealed erythema and mucopurulent discharge surrounding both eyes. So we can conclude that this boy has neonatal conjunctivitis caused by chlamydia trachomatis, more specifically serotypes D through K. Therefore, the correct answer is D, pelvic inflammatory disease. From the image, recall that all of the information around the dog in the middle part of the image right here represents serotypes D through K. The two kids in the car with red eyes right here should help you remember that neonatal conjunctivitis occurs one to two weeks following birth. And finally, the pregnant woman whose pelvis is on fire right here should help you remember that the same serotypes can cause pelvic inflammatory disease. A is incorrect because this is describing lymphogranuloma venarium, which is caused by serotypes L1, L2, and L3, not serotypes D through K. B is incorrect because this is the leading cause of blindness in the world and is caused by serotypes A, B, and C. Finally, C is incorrect because this is a complication associated with gonorrhea, but gonorrhea causing neonatal conjunctivitis typically occurs two to five days after birth, so the timing doesn't make sense for this to be the correct answer. You may have also thought about Rider syndrome, which is an arthropathy caused by chlamydia. However, chlamydia is not typically associated with septic arthritis, so this answer choice was alluding to Neisseria gonorrhea. So C is incorrect. And again, the correct answer is D, pelvic inflammatory disease. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about chlamydia.